Welcome. We've all heard the arguments. The earth is warming. No, no, it's cooling. Let's see if we can put an end to that argument once and for all right here and now. So what could be changing the earth's temperature? There's lots of different factors. Here's some of the main ones. We could have an asteroid impact. That would produce a distinct cooling trend. But I think we can eliminate that one because we haven't noticed a major asteroid impact. We could have a major volcanic eruption which would produce a cooling trend at least for a couple of years. But as we haven't had one of those we can eliminate that too. There are changes in the Earth's orbit, the so-called Milankovitch cycles, where the eccentricity of the Earth changes the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so the amount changes the amount of radiation that we get, and then the precession of and the tilt of the Earth's spin axis actually changes what part of the Earth see what uh, temperatures, and so that affects our uh, climate significantly. However, we can eliminate this too because those changes take tens of thousands of years uh, and so the heating and cooling that we're seeing is on a period of decades so this doesn't fit the time scale at all. Well it's the Sun, of course if the Sun gets warmer the, the Earth will warm, if the Sun gets cooler the Earth will cool. So we should take a look at that one. There's also atmospheric composition which changes the energy budget of the Earth. So if you have more heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, you will get warming. And if you get fewer of those gases in the atmosphere, you'll get cooling. And all of these effects and any others are magnified by two major effects called albedo and humidity. Albedo is the reflectivity of the Earth. The higher the albedo, the more energy the Earth reflects. And that's mainly due to ice and snow. So if the temperatures go up and we lose ice and snow, the albedo drops and the Earth absorbs more energy and heats up yet further. And similarly with humidity, as um, the temperature goes up, the air can hold more water vapor. Water vapor is a very powerful greenhouse gas, so it traps more radiation and the Earth warms up. If the temperature drops, the humidity in the air will drop and it will trap less heat and so the Earth will cool. So we need to understand how each one of these factors is changing to really get a good picture of what is causing the Earth's temperature to change. I know what some of you are thinking, oh he didn't mention natural cycles. Well even natural cycles have to have a cause. Something has to kick off the oscillation that becomes the cycle and then something has to maintain it. So you need a displacement force and a restoring force. In the example of a pendulum displacement force is when you take the pendulum to one side and release it. That gives the system a potential energy. As gravity tries to take it back down again to its nadir, it will impart kinetic energy. So at the bottom of its swing it will have a lot of velocity, so it will go up the other side until again gravity reduces that kinetic energy to potential energy and then the whole process reverses. So this is what you're looking for when you appeal to natural cycles. And I've never seen this done in any argument involving natural cycles where people can identify what the displacement force is and what the restoring forces are and show they're of sufficient magnitude to explain the phenomenon that we're seeing. Because in science it's not only important to have a qualitative argument that seems to hold water, you also have to have a quantitative argument that holds water. Also cycles tend to be regular. And most of these so-called natural cycles that people talk about are not all that regular. So you have to have yet another set of forces acting upon the cycle to make it irregular. And again, you have to identify them and prove them to be quantitatively consistent. Let's take a look at some potential cooling effects. One of them is aerosols. There are a lot of different types of aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. Some produce cooling and some produce warming. But the predominant effect is cooling and that is generally caused by sulfur dioxide. However, over the last few decades, the level of aerosols in our atmosphere has been steadily falling, except for during times of major eruptions like Hale Kihon and Pinotobu, which puts extra aerosols in the atmosphere for a couple of years following the eruption. So this shows a downward trend. That would therefore say that this would be a warming trend, not a cooling trend. So we can eliminate aerosols. Another one that we identified earlier was solar activity. And that's shown here uh, by the sunspot number 
and shown in blue at the bottom of this curve. If you look over the last few years, you see there's been a steady decline in uh, sunspot number, and that uh, would be a cooling trend. However, the question then comes down to, quantitatively, is that enough to make any difference? So let's take a look at the range of these things. So we're comparing the level at solar maximum to solar minimum, but that's not the effect on the Earth. The effect on the Earth is the amount of radiation that we receive. Now, if you go to the total solar radiance and see what the modulation in the amount of radiation that the Earth is receiving over a solar cycle, the modulation is about 0.1%, which doesn't sound like much because it isn't. To put that in context, let's take a look at the modulation of the radiation budget from the Sun uh, due to the changes in the distance of the Earth from the Sun due to its elliptical orbit. Now from June to January, the level change uh, in radiation from the uh, Sun is 7%, 70 times larger than the uh, modulation that we're seeing in the solar cycle. So the solar cycle is going to be a relatively minor effect. Another possibility that some people raise is cosmic rays. The story goes here that a weakening solar magnetic field will increase the number of cosmic rays reaching the Earth. They will form more clouds. More clouds will reflect more sunlight away uh, and that will cool the planet. There's lots of reasons why that argument doesn't hold any water, uh, but the primary one is that the level of cosmic rays has not changed for the last 60 years. So that pretty much rules this particular model out. Now let's take a look at some potential warming effects. And the most obvious one is greenhouse gases. Examples of those are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs, ozone, and so on. And one thing you will note is that for the last couple of hundred years, they've been increasing quite rapidly ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Before that, they were relatively stable. An effect that we mentioned earlier is albedo. Now, if albedo is increasing, then we would expect cooling. And if albedo is decreasing, we would expect warming. Unfortunately, there isn't a great deal of albedo data, uh, but what we have from Ceres and Modus really shows very little uh, change in the albedo over this five-year period. Uh, so um, that would seem to rule out that the albedo is changing very greatly at the moment. Specific humidity is a different case. We have records of that going back to 1950, and you can see that over that time period, there's been a general upward trend in specific humidity. And the only way that can happen is if there's warming already, and the specific humidity is amplifying that warming. One of the things that uh, annoys me more than anything is probably weather anecdotes that people use their local weather conditions to dismiss global warming. Local weather is not necessarily an indicator of global climate. For example, the blizzards that are occurring in the Midwest uh, in January were occurring at the same time as tennis players in Australia were fainting from the heat. So one case you could say, oh, where's global warming when we need it? The other case you can say, here's an example of global warming. Neither of those are valid arguments. Well, the only way we're going to be able to resolve this issue is to see what the data tells us. So what does the data tell us? Well, for the moment, let's ignore thermometers. Let's take a look at what other parameters are indicating whether the planet's warming or cooling. Well, rising sea levels indicate that the planet is warming. About half the sea level rise is due to increasing uh, ocean temperatures, and the other half is due to increased runoff from melting ice. Of course, if the ice is melting, that would imply that temperatures are going up also. We've also seen seasonal shifts. If you look at maps of planting zones, they've been moving poleward for the last few decades. Here's another indicator. This is the time on the left for the first leaf for various trees, and uh, on the right for the first blossom in various trees. Apart from the southeast, just about the rest of the country, all those times have been moving earlier. Uh, so that would again indicate that uh, temperatures have been warming. And as I mentioned before, specific humidity can only increase if temperature increases. And you can see here there's been a steady increase in specific humidity over both land and oceans. So that would imply that both those sets of temperatures are increasing. So what do the thermometers tell us? If you take the surface measurements, this is from NOAA, you see that for the last 50 plus years, there's been a steady increase in global temperatures. 
Now this is reflected both in the land and the ocean, so it's a pretty solid result. If you go to the lowest troposphere, this is using the satellite measurements, you get a very similar picture. This is the data from RSS. And again, you see a steady rise in global temperatures. Next, we'll take a look at the mid troposphere. That's about eight kilometers in altitude. And you'll see a very similar trend to the lower troposphere, except for the gradient is a little less. And then you go to the lower stratosphere. That's about 20 kilometers in altitude and you get a decline in temperature. Now this is the unique aspect of the anthropogenic global warming theory that it can explain this. None of the other theories can. For example, if it were the sun that was causing global warming, uh, this uh, layer would be warming the fastest and it isn't. You often hear that the temperature data has been manipulated. That sounds bad, doesn't it? And that they, uh, and so you must use raw data. Let me explain why that's a complete and utter nonsense. Manipulated in their terms means calibrated or statistically analyzed. Now here's an example of raw data. This is the total solar irradiance measured by different instruments. Now remember all of these instruments are looking at the same object at the same time using very similar technology. And so what would you conclude from this set of uh, data? Well the first conclusion is that the instruments don't agree very well with one another even where they overlap. If you took the draw data just as it was and fit a, fit a line through this, you'd say there's been a tremendous drop in total solar radiance, so the sun is going out. And you can't really say very much about the size or duration of the solar cycles. Now, if you take this data and you take out the differences between the instruments and calibrate them, and then do a statistical analysis of that, you get this. This is the so-called composite total solar radiance. And now you can start making sense of the data. You can see what the trends are in the data. You can see when the solar maxima are and the solar minimum are, how big they are and so on. So you can actually get science, useful scientific information out of this. So trying to use raw data is just a fool's errand and you have to calibrate the data with respect to one another. And you have to analyze that data statistically to get meaningful uh, numbers and also uncertainty on, on those numbers. Well, who's going to win this battle? If you take just the natural changes that we've been talking about, uh, you get this blue curve, which shows since about 1960, there's been a steady decline in global temperatures. There's your cooling. But that is very much being overwhelmed by the human influences. That would be the increasing uh, greenhouse gases, aerosols, and land use changes. And so effectively, we are both warming and cooling, but the warming is overwhelming the cooling. And when you put the two together, you basically get back to this curve or very close to it. Now, why should we have any confidence in this sort of calculation? Well, because lots of different groups do it. Here are the results from six different groups who use different data in different ways, do different statistical analyses on them and so on, but they all basically get the same result. And that in science gives you a great deal of confidence that this is a result is correct. So what's all this about an upcoming ice age? It's based on this picture that I showed you earlier, namely a declining uh, level of solar activity over the last 60 years. The assumption is that this uh, trend will continue and will end up in a grand solar minimum or a new Maunder minimum. And then they'll inevitably show a picture like this of the Thames freezing over during the 17th century. There are several fallacies in this argument. Well, the first one is that this trend will continue. And secondly, that these pictures of the Thames freezing over were a result of the Maunder minimum. What they actually are a result of is the little ice age, which started several hundred years before the Maunder minimum and went on a hundred years after. So the most the Maunder minimum could have done was if it was reducing Earth's temperatures at all, was make the global temperatures a little bit lower than they would have been otherwise because of the little ice age. How likely is a grand solar minimum? Well, let's take that plot that I showed you just a few seconds ago, the uh, sunspot number, and it's declining over the last 60 years, and extend the x-axis out to 2100. And then take the decline rate that, that we've derived from that and project it forward. That would say we'd get to zero sunspot number by 2060. What happens then? Does it just level off? Does it go negative? You know, if a trend continues, it should continue. And so by this trend, you'd get a negative sunspot number. So you get bright. So perhaps you have bright sunspots. That doesn't make any sense at all. Of course, this is just nonsense. Let's actually take a look 
at the last 400 years of sunspot number and see if that will give us any guide to what's going to happen. So here is the uh, solar cycle 24 peak. Now how many other cycles have a similar peak to that? I've identified six of them here. Now you will note that every single one of those six uh, low cycles was followed by a higher cycle. So the chances are that this low cycle will be followed by a larger cycle if the history of the, the sunspot cycle is anything to go by. Now also take a look at the beginning of the Monde Minimum. There is a, a solar cycle just prior to that and it's a fairly hefty one. So that would say that the size of the cycle preceding a Monde Minimum is basically irrelevant. So all those that are drawing conclusions from the sizes of solar cycles are just talking nonsense. Well, I'm sorry to rain on your parade, but the Earth is warming and it seems to be at an accelerating rate. There is no scientific evidence for cooling on a global scale at the moment, so we're not about to enter into an ice age. There's no scientific evidence for the sun going into a grand solar minimum. And even if it did, so what and who cares, because it wouldn't make very much difference to global temperatures. That's it for today. Until next time, goodbye.